Hey guys, on this episode, we have Jacob Hill, the founder of the GRC Academy. We discuss the new DOD regulations for CMMC and its different levels. We also discuss the Academy and how it can help companies prepare for CMMC. Without further ado, enjoy the show. This podcast is sponsored by Promus Incorporated, the leading provider of fully electric servo presses for manufacturing. Promus provides global support for pressing and motion control applications in multiple industries. With precise positioning and in-process force monitoring, your company will begin to see ROI on day one. Call 810-229-9334 or email sales at promisinc.com to speak with an expert engineer about your application today. Hey guys, welcome to Manufacturing Unscripted. I'm your host, Matt Rawl. And I'm Lauren. Today our guest is Jacob Hill um, from the GRC Academy. He's the founder of the Academy. Hey Jacob, how you doing? Hi, doing great. How y'all? Doing good. Yeah, we're doing great. Um, pretty excited to talk to you. Uh, we brought you on for some cybersecurity stuff and um, I know there's uh, some hidden agenda there for Lauren and that's one <laughs> of her pastimes. <laughs> She likes, um, but just talking with you, there's just like a lot of stuff going on. Um, and before we get in that though, I would love, uh, uh, being a first time guest to learn more about your journey, um, through your industry and kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again for having me. I'm, I'm Jacob Hill, as he said, the founder of GRC Academy, and that is a side hustle for me right now. So by day, I'm the director of cyber operations at a uh, small business. We support the federal government, uh, DOD, and and also some private entities too. So how, I've, how I kind of got here was about, I got my start about 15 years ago uh, doing IT support, the typical IT help desk, you know, um, uh, doing that type of thing. And I got to get my hands dirty with a lot of different areas, which was uh, really cool. And then uh, for a while I was doing that. And then I moved over into the government as a government employee. And I did that for about five years. Um, got to do a lot of interesting things. I was working at a acquisition command. And uh, so it was over, over at the Marine Corps. And uh, most of my career has been supporting the DOD in one shape or, or form in another. Uh, so I learned a lot in that area. That's where I would say I got my start in cybersecurity. And after that, I jumped back out into uh, defense contracting and uh, worked on a really interesting program uh, had to do with missiles. So that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after that, I moved over to my current position where I am right now, and I came in to support a government contract, and now I'm focused on the corporate side, the corporate security side. It's funny that you mentioned the missiles because um, in my job, we've we've done some work with missiles, and when people mm -hmm. always ask what we do, I always – that's one thing I always, like, throw in just because it's such a wow factor that people are like, oh, you're so cool. And yeah, like, well, it's how you relate to the children, Matthew, <laughs> yeah, that whenever yeah. you're doing stuff, you're yeah, like, oh, yeah, well, we work with missiles, so well, as it's a like, what do you do? Yeah, yeah, as a mechanical engineer, everyone's like, oh, so you could be like Iron Man or Tony Stark. I'm like, I'm nothing like that, No, but I do work with missiles. <laughs> so, so, That's awesome. So, yeah. yeah, I was able to do the, uh, the training simulations of uh, sitting at the controller and okay. I had a buddy, and he was over there. And every time he he launched a missile, he said "boots on the ground." I was like, "I don't think that's what that means." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... it was fun. It was very interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess is this where you are today? Is that kind of like going through high school and everything? Is where you thought you'd end up? Because it's I think it's it's such a unique profession that I I can't imagine that your job showed up in the high school <laughs> aptitude test that said this is what you're going to do when you get older. Yeah. Back in the day, I mean, co computers are way more common uh, yep. these days, of course. And so, But back in the day, my parents, they were tech-oriented. My, mm -hmm. my mom was, she was always on her computer doing stuff. Um, my dad was an IT guy. 
So it was natural. It was a natural step for me. Yeah. And uh, I did get into the first IT help desk position with his help. It was at the same company he was with. So thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of like what they say. It's like you can't really get experience without experience, you know, like yeah. especially mm-hmm. in IT. It's like um, for an entry level position, you have to have experience. And you're like, well, how do how do I get there? Like, yeah. Yeah. So knowing somebody is definitely helpful. <laughs> Oh, yeah, especially back then, because these days there are all all kinds of free training and Mm -hmm. uh, excellent, excellent free resources out there, low cost resources. And uh, I I would like to think if I was a young lad again, I would try to avail myself of all of that. But I'd probably just be playing games. You know how it is? Yeah. No, I know exactly how it is. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I kind of let's jump into it. Um, And one of the main things that we wanted to talk about, and I want to make sure I get this right, so I wrote it down, uh, was the CMMC, which is the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Is that right? Yes. Um, So can you tell a little bit about what that is? And then I know there's a change happening, and if you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, yeah. In order to speak about CMMC, we have to back up a bit and talk about from a basic standpoint, CMMC is a certification program for a set of cybersecurity requirements. Um, the main set, it's a 110 security controls, which, um, you know, they go from make sure you have a signed in log for, from, for people when they come into your facility to, you know, you have to make sure you have username and passwords, multi-factor authentication for certain systems. Um, but The actual set of requirements come from a document uh, called NIST 800-171, and uh, NIST is the National Institute of Science and Technology, and they were tasked to create these requirements to protect controlled unclassified information. And so when you think about CMMC, you're thinking about, okay, it's the, its main purpose is to focus, is, is focused on protecting controlled unclassified information. The reason why it's different and everybody knows about it is because up to this point, uh, and NIST 800-171 is federal as mm-hmm. well. So it's it expands beyond DOD. Yep. Um, it's the security standard to protect CUI or controlled yep. and classified information, as I said. But for DOD, they've realized that self-attestation of companies saying, hey, well, uh, we've got all these requirements and trust us, we've got it taken care of. That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And so CMMC, what that does is for the bulk of companies out there, well, depending on how it goes, we'll yep. see. Um, we'll get into that. But it's requiring a third party to come in and assess your cybersecurity uh, in re- in relation to those 110 requirements, and there are different levels, and we can, we can talk about that in mm-hmm. a moment. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you mentioned like the third party. Is that something that like the federal government will kind of push down, or is that something like the the companies are going to be responsible for finding that third party and saying, "Can you come in and do a check?" They've set up what they call an entire ecosystem yep. of assessors. And uh, not, not long ago, maybe a few years ago, I heard the term C3PAO. I was like, mm-hmm. what, C3PO? You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've actually you know. heard the people yeah. in charge say by accident C3PO. So that's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah, that But is funny. Um, it's uh, just in a, a C3PAO, and I'm probably going to forget what it means right now, but that's an assessment organization. Okay. And the, a CMMC assessment organization. And then you have individual assessors that would be employed by a C3PAO. So when you see that weird term, that's referring to the organization who employs CMMC assessors. So they there is a, a marketplace out there and it's actually the Cyber AB, the mm-hmm. Cyber Accreditation Body is responsible for uh, running that piece of it. And they are a, they're a third party entity. Um, I think they're a nonprofit. And so yep. the DOD wanted some independence there. And so they, they do work hand in hand with the DOD, mm-hmm. but they're a separate entity. And then um, you mentioned the levels. So I, I imagine the the third party's involvement 
obviously with the testing and with the company will vary significantly depending on the level that you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. For CMMC level one, that is dedicated to protecting what's called federal contract information or FCI. Mm -hmm. And when you get a government contract, your contract is considered FCI. Um, unless it's marked otherwise, um, they want to, they want to protect that. Um, it requires ba- what's called basic safeguarding, and level one has seventeen requirements, and so it's not nearly as uh, you know time consuming and expensive as handling a level two certification, which has one hundred and ten. And I didn't I didn't think when I looked at level one that level one was too out of the norm for what probably most companies already do anyway. Yes. Or should yes. do at least. Now, now, right, exactly. Now, level one does not require a third party assessment. It just requires a self-assessment, which has been what we've been doing, you know, for the last several years, just being, uh, just been doing that self-assessment. Now, level, level two is when you get into the third party assessment and all of what I'm saying right now is, uh, as you said, there are some changes coming down based mm. on what uh, a government process called rulemaking. And some of this could change. I don't really expect it to, uh, but uh, the bulk of level two certifi- level two uh, required, the, the contracts will require third party assessment. And then, um, and then that, that was the one that you said is 112. And then there's one above that, correct? Yes, there is a third level of CMMC, and that is what's called, of course, level three. Yeah, <laughs> and that we don't know much about it uh, beyond the fact that the requirements are going to come from another document called NIST eight hundred one seventy two. We don't know how many they'll pull from that document. Yeah, it could be twenty more. It could be thirty more. But I imagine, <laughs> I imagine those requirements are going to be quite expensive, because mm-hmm. they could want things like a twenty four seven security operation center. You know, watching your network. You know, uh, so that will be a minority, a subset of contracts. Um, And and what I should say is that the CMMC level requirements, what is required is per contract. Mm -hmm. That's where the CMMC level requirements come from. Uh, Everyone will have to implement and comply with CMMC. Uh, Some (laughs) or most will have to be certified depending on how that shakes out because a lot of this is up to DOD and the individual agencies to say, okay, well, I think this contract is a level two require level two because it has this type of information, um, but it's all based on that the contract. Mm-hmm. Um, from your experience, just kind of work, you know, and what you've done, um, say someone wants to just meet level one requirements. Mm-hmm. I guess what would your estimation be in terms of like time and effort to just to get to that point? Yeah. Well, it depends if you have. Some companies don't have any internal IT, Mm -hmm. so they're, you know, they may not even be outsourcing. They might just have had a smart guy they bring in that's part time, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So assuming you let's assume you have an IT person. Yeah. If you do, then I would say probably and it also depends on the size of the company (laughs) and also how you scope it. Right. uh, Because there are different ways to approach CMMC. Mm-hmm. You could enclave off an area and in, in your network, and you could say, well, this section is going to be where we have our controlled and classified information, and the rest of it, it, it just won't touch. Yeah. And uh, there's ways to do that um, using firewalls and, you know, all that cool stuff. Um, so it depends on a number of factors, size of company, your, your technical approach, how you design this. Um, but... I don't know. I, I would say, you know, three to six months, probably something like it could be more, could be less, depending on yep. uh, those factors I mentioned. No, I mean, I think that's a good point, too, of of being able to even just kind of quarantine a section yeah. of your stuff um, just to accommodate. Because yes. I think I think that even that alone would put some people at ease that they don't have to worry about the entire company. It's just a portion of it. Yes. 
One concern that I know the DOD has, and I share the same concern as a cybersecurity guy, is that the companies will just say, okay, I'll enclave, I'll, I'm going to enclave all of this off and I'm still going to operate insecurely, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just going to, this, this, <laughs> this cybersecurity stuff, we'll yeah. push it to the side, you know, we'll operate or, you know, we'll document that we've, we're doing all this stuff, but uh, for the main business, we're not going to do that. Um, I think there are a lot of risks to doing that. If you do require uh, cyber insurance, that's going to hit you. Um, and just in general, if you're insecure, CMMC level three, going back to that, is all about addressing addressing something called the advanced persistent threat. Uh, most of the time, if you're compromised, you find out uh, six to eight months later. Mm-hmm. And so if you got one side of the business, that's just, you know, wild west. Yeah. <laughs> And then you got the enclave, which is supposed to be correct, supposed to be secure. Yep. Well, the concern is that uh, an ad- attacker could migrate into that secured enclave. Yep. So uh, if you're going to do this, I would advise, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, try well, to at least do it uh, the right way. Yep. As I, you know, that's my opinion. But mm-hmm. um, Well, you opened the can of worms, so I'm going to go there. And I, I told you this before that I'm going to bring this up. Um, <laughs> what stories that you are able to share? Um, can you give some examples of um, kind of practical examples of where, you know, they didn't necessarily maybe follow some say, cybersecurity kind of precautionary measures and um, mm-hmm. ended up, you know, hurting the company overall? Because um, obviously as a non-IT guy, yeah. Uh, when it comes to IT, this is where my interests lie, because <laughs> like this is this is where the the um, kind of the bizarre and the crazy happens. And you know, mm-hmm. this is you know, you hear the term hacking and things like that or ransomware, and I think those just kind of become everyday words until yes. you actually live it. Yes. And and yes. so what what do you got that you can share? I would say Just open up the floor yeah, for you. Yeah, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there was an incident back, I think, in 2012 uh, that impacted LinkedIn, and basically what happened is this: the, there were these these bad guys, right? They were they wanted to compromise. Um, I, I don't know if they had their initial sites on LinkedIn or whatever, but anyway, they they ended up targeting LinkedIn. So what they did is they started looking. Uh, what's called OSINT, um, open source intelligence. Mm-hmm. And they started looking on LinkedIn and they said, okay, well, if I want to target LinkedIn, I'm going to find somebody who works there. And so they were looking through these different profiles and they happened uh, upon this uh, LinkedIn engineer who uh, it was, you know, it was, it was just an engineer out there. But what was interesting is that he had a website. And so the guy went to his website and uh, what's what's interesting about that particular website was that it was hosted in the guy's house. Mm-hmm. So websites, uh, if if you're not uh, keeping up with patching and yep. uh, security best practices, they can be compromised. Yep. So this guy was able to compromise the website and the web server. And so at that point, he had access to the guy's home network. And then he started looking on the guy's network. He's like, okay, so what else is on here that I can Mm -hmm. try to attack? And he found the guy's uh, personal, I think it was a Mac, uh, some sort of Mac, probably a MacBook. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy hadn't, I mean, it's his personal computer, right? (laughs) And the guy hadn't uh, necessarily secured it. So the guy was launching what's called a brute force attack, uh, where you... Uh, just basically have a dictionary of passwords and you keep trying and trying and trying mm-hmm. and trying until you're successful. And finally he was able to break into the guy's MacBook pro or whatever it was. And again, it's, it's the guy's personal computer, you yep. know, you're not necessarily supposed to be working uh, using yep. that for work, but what he found on the MacBook was a set of credentials certificates, if I'm uh, not mistaken to LinkedIn's corporate network. And yep. 
I believe there were also VPN credentials on oh, that dude. on that system yep. too, and that's how they compromise LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a process, procedures, policy, uh, when it comes down to it, are they're annoying, yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. and nobody likes to read them, but right. they but they are actually important because it's not all about technical controls. People have to uh, play a part here too, yeah. and. Yep. Uh, as people oftentimes were the weakest layer i feel like we're always the weakest layer yes i mean like social hacking is huge and yes they can just call somebody and they give them all their information and they don't even realize it like yeah that stuff just blows my mind well yeah that's right i mean just recently my mother-in-law um on facebook all of a sudden a new account started and they started friend requesting everybody and everyone quickly jumped to that she was hacked mm. and that she needs to like jump and change her password. And I said, don't. Do they have, they don't, they might, they don't have access to your actual account. They're creating a fake account so that if you've yeah. received any emails that says you've been compromised, please send your email. Don't go through the email. You need to go to the website and change it at the site, not through the email. And she's like, oh, okay. Like, and sure enough, she found the email that says, you know, you're, you're, your account may have been compromised. Yeah. yeah. Uh, change your password. And I was like, that, that will, you will lose your account if you click on that link. That's I right. Like, I was like, because everyone quickly jumped. And I think that's something too that it's just like the misconception of there's a profile of my picture on it. I've been hacked. Yes. And it's like, no, I can just take your picture and make a profile. Oh, yeah. It's, they want you to think you've been hacked. So then all of a sudden now you're changing all your stuff and they're just going to know what it is. Right. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, so that literally happened last night. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's always crazy. Just like when you see it, um, and just being able to recognize it, I think is the biggest thing. And you know, what's funny is that there, these technology software providers and all that, they're kind of in a, a tough spot because let's just say a basic one, like multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. If they enabled that by default, people probably wouldn't use it. Yeah. That mm -hmm. that particular software because it's annoying. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's that additional step. But when something happens, uh, you know, oh, you know, that yep. they blame the provider. Yep. So it's it's pretty interesting. Um, there was this, uh, there was a Coinbase, which is that uh, yep. you know crypto crypto marketplace. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty fascinating, but uh, they released some stats that I I can't remember the exact stat, but it was over 50% or maybe 70, uh, something like that, of account takeovers. People were using text text message-based uh, two-step authentication. Yep. And that is the least secure, you know, um, the least secure form of multi-factor authentication um, because... If uh, if you've got a guy who's really motivated to get you, uh, mm -hmm. he'll get your phone number. He'll socially engineer your carrier, and he'll say, "Hey, I lost my phone, but I, you know, can we transfer it to this SIM card, please?" Yep. Mm -hmm. And some carriers are better than others, but uh, if you've got a carrier that's especially uh, prone to that or not, their policies aren't as good because uh, <laughs> you know how socially engineering it works. Yep. Like, oh man, you know, I. I'm I'm late. My my wife yep. is in the hospital where she's gonna have a baby, yeah. and I really need my phone right now. You know, yep. what, yeah. whatever. Or they have like story. kids crying in the background. Yes, or like <laughs> something crazy. Like yes, yeah, yeah. Just, yes, yeah. yes. But it's it's interesting because uh, Coinbase. I mean, it has a lot of money in there, and mm -hmm. uh, there was a vulnerability with Coinbase. This was years ago, but basically, it allowed people to see the uh, accounts. It allowed to see. Uh, accounts, but it also allowed to see how much money they had. Oh, jeez. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, oh, you know, it's it's not always, uh, you can't always rely on these providers to be secure. Yep. Um, well, great. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pressure you for any more. Um, <laughs> let's talk a bit, a bit more about your side hustle. Yeah. Um, the GRC Academy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. I recently launched it. Uh, and uh, the first course that I put out there was a CMMC overview course. And what was interesting is that the DOD and the Cyber AB, there has been little focus 
from my perspective, at least, and I think a lot of people in the profession would agree on the actual businesses uh, that have to implement it. Mm -hmm. And so there's been some, there's a lot of great information from consultants and from DOD too, but it's in disparate locations and it's, it's, it's overwhelming uh, to be honest. So I saw that there was a hole to fill and I built this CMMC overview course and it's less than three hours straight to the point. And uh, the lectures are, you know, a long lecture is nine minutes and there's not many of those. Most of them are three to five, uh, which makes it really nice for me for editing. But also it makes it very nice for people because they can just go back to the course if they need a real quick refresher yeah. on that one topic. So uh, I think it's a lot better than the typical format of one hour lectures. You cover a hundred different things, mm -hmm. a lot easier to consume as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm getting really great feedback on it. So I'm, you know, I'm excited about it. Yeah. So you would recommend like, let's just say manufacturing companies. It's what we mostly deal with here. Uh, manufacturing companies take this academy so that they know how to be prepared. Is mm -hmm. that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Okay. Certainly. Certainly. The Cyber AB does have a number of uh, certifications for practitioners, for mm -hmm. consultants. Um, yeah. I've, I started to take the one for the consultants and um I know I'm biased, but I feel like mine is a lot better. <laughs> Just the the quality, the format, and, and all that stuff. Yeah. But, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say that it gives you a great foundation. The whole goal is to enable you to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I looked at it a little bit um, so far, and yeah, no, I think it I think it's good. It's a good pace because, like you mentioned, you can jump on it for a little bit and then yeah. go away, and then you know you're not you're not feeling like you're m walking away mid seminar or anything like that yeah. because they are short videos. So yeah. um, you're not necessarily too worried about either going back and having to re-listen real quick to remember where you were at or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, you know, everyone is super busy these days. Yeah. Um, so kind of putting it in those smaller videos and breaking it down, I think is, is a big help for everyone because they can kind of squeeze yeah. it in anywhere. For sure. Um, but yeah, no, it's so far I've looked at it. I mean, it's, Again, it's just more cur curiosity for me, just because um, we are in a man. You know, the company we work for is, is manufacturing, and um, I, I definitely some of the things that were on the the level one list. I know that our IT group has has implemented mm -hmm. in the last few years, and and it it made me wonder if if this was the reason if they if yeah. they were ahead of the game like they probably were. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the stuff has been implemented and. That's um, good. And so, it, it, you know, I, I guess, you know, for a company that, you know, helps me pay my bills, <laughs> it's it puts me a little bit at ease that, that we do have <laughs> right, someone right. that is looking out for us. Right. Yeah, so, go ahead. From a, oh, sorry. From a business perspective, I mean, watching these videos and being prepared for those DOD contracts, I mean, they're really competitive. So having that mm -hmm. advantage over your competition is huge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Something to be aware of, I, we, I touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to circle back yeah. to it, was that the DOD is in charge of uh, determining what CMMC level uh, a particular contract might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have, clause, there's a number of DFARS clauses. Those, those are uh, so the DOD supplement to the Federal Acquisition Regulation contractual clauses. And there's a number of DFARS clauses that you should look for uh, today uh, to see where you might actually need to focus, you know, if it, whether it's CMMC level one mm -hmm. or CMMC level two. Um, I'll, I'll list them out. So DFARS 252.204-7012, uh, if you have that in your contracts and you handle CUI, um, plan for CMMC level two. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, a few other clauses that will supplement that. Uh, DFAR is, I'll just say, 1719 and 7020. If you if you have a clause, this one's called FAR 52.204-21. If you have that in your contracts, uh, that's a good indicator that you know CMMC level one might be the one you want to target. But <laughs> it's important to plan ahead because mm -hmm. uh, like you said, the, it, the government. Yeah. And also just from a subcontracting perspective, because if you're a subcontractor, 
And the Prime says, okay, well, we have a CMMC level two contract. However, we think that you might be able to just come in with a CMMC level one because mm-hmm. you may not be handling CUI. Yep. That would be very nice to the Prime. But the problem is, is that it's a risk determination. And it really could be a differentiating factor when it comes to partnering because the primes might see it as risky to work with a company that is less secure than they are and less secure than the requirements of the contract. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a consideration. I mean, you know, the market will play a a large, has a lot to play in this because there's only so many manufacturers out there. Okay. <laughs> so, well, the other the other nice thing too was is as you mentioned it is contract based, so you can target level one contracts if that's as far as you want to go. Yes. Um, and if you do get to level two, obviously, then you you can go for level two. So I mean, that's the other nice thing as well is it is contract based, so you can opt out of level two stuff if you're not there yet. Yes. Yes. The thing about it is we don't know. We truly don't know mm-hmm. how many contracts will be. Le- only level yeah, one right it could be just your janitor it could mm-hmm. just be your landscaper or going <laughs> it, yeah. there was a story i was going to share there was this uh, i was speaking to this lady and she was talking about how she was in this meeting this military guy was in there and he said well you know even if you bring porter potties you're gonna have to bring you're gonna have to be cmmc level two because we give you a map and that mm-hmm. map has designations on it that make it cui Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, the, the government's probably just not going to get their porter bodies. Yeah. Um, but the government doesn't always make smart decisions. So <laughs> they could be in a lurch, but also yep. you could be in a lurch too. So it's very important to just be aware of what's happening and plan ahead. Mm-hmm. Especially with the lead time on getting any of these implemented. Like you said, it could yep. be up to six months or even a year for for a level two. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. I've seen some estimates that say, Going from level, you know, zero to hero Mm -hmm. for level two could be 12 to 18 months. Wow. Okay. That's good to know. Which Uh, is the lead time for a lot of projects. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Twice as long. Um, Well, Jacob, is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you'd love to mention? Yes. One more thing. A lot of people are waiting on CMMC. Uh, I think there's a, we're in rulemaking right now. And Mm -hmm. so I think, honestly, some people think that CMMC is going to go away. However, if you handle CUI, you already have DFAR 7012 in your contracts. And DFAR 7019 requires you to submit a score against those requirements. What I'm saying is you already are contractually obligated to implement those requirements um, if you have CUI. CMMC Mm -hmm. will come around. Third party will come in. They'll assess you, make sure you're speaking the truth, you know, Mm -hmm. and but you're already contractually obligated if you have those clauses and you handle CUI. So um, if you do, uh, don't wait (laughs) because the government, there's another clause called DFAR 7020, 252-204-7020, and that allows the government to come in even now, uh, today, as of today, to come in and give you a call and say, hey, we're coming. You know, yep. we're going to do an assessment. I mean, they have a few levels of assessment that they'll do, a medium or a mm-hmm. high assessment. And that's basically level of rigor, you know, that's involved yep. with that. But uh, if you have those requirements, uh, you've signed off that yep. you're willing to let the government come in and assess you already. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the whole the whole CMMC ecosystem is uh, not involved in that process. They do have something called the Joint Sur- Surveillance Program. That is voluntary, uh, but um, just be aware of that. If you're contractually obligated today, I would not wait. Yeah, yeah. that's a very, very good point. Um, all right, Jacob, uh, you, you're you a very busy person, and I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, again, thank you for being on the show. Um, I, I think I think it's great. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely a um, – It's the scare that we need every now and then. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, like – just remember, this is always happening behind you. It's always yes. happening, yeah, and like, then just just the whole CMMC is coming, right? It's not. Yes. I mean, it's here. It's not going away, and um, I, you know, I you don't hear about it that much. So, mm-hmm. um, 
I, I'm glad we were able to kind of bring you on to the show and, and, and discuss it. Um, Thank you so much for having me. I really yep. appreciate it. Um, and uh, Lauren, did you want to? Yeah. So share everybody, um, we're up live on YouTube. So we're sharing this video. If you want to see our faces, if you want to see Jacob, uh, come join us on the YouTube channel and subscribe, please. Don't forget to like, rate, and review this podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. And then, if you want to be a guest on this podcast, you can email us at podcast at promiseinc dot com. All right. And Jacob, thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks, Jacob. Thank right, you. Bye. Till next time. Bye. Goodbye. All right. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by Promise Incorporated, hosted by Matthew Rawl, produced by myself, Lauren Rawl, mixed and edited by Ben Parsons. Please make sure to subscribe and rate this podcast. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at podcast at promiseinc.com. Thank you.